We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. In 2003, Nike signed 13-year-old Freddie Adu to a seven-figure contract. But Freddie didn't live up to the hype. He has turned down every single documentary project looking closely at the details of his career. Until now. People are going to look at everything you did because of the hype surrounding your arrival and what they think you can be. I'm Grant Wall, and this is American Prodigy, Freddie Adu, from Blue Wire Podcasts. This is the California Golden Bearcast, a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Indeed and Bet Online. Enjoy the episode. What is up, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of. The Bearcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Andy. Along with me is the man who watched the big game in person, Rob Wong. What's going on, Rob? How are you feeling? I am I am still cold from the time I spent in the press box with the window open as the sun sets. Like it was all you know how you we've been in the press box. Like, you know how it already gets cold, regardless of if it's like the windows are closed or not. And it got even colder because the windows were open the entire game. So that that yeah, I think the thing the thing that maybe you wouldn't know as a fan, but uh, just to give it a different perspective, is that when there are fans in the stadium, I I swear the warmth of those bodies creates more warmth in the press box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it like rises. Yeah, heat rises. Yeah, heat rises, and it comes into the press box. But because no one was there, and it's you know the cold. The cold feeling of just, you know, paper cutouts of fans in the stands um, and the window open the entire game because of, you know, COVID protocol and, and fresh air. It, it was so cold. How did Avi get um, – how did he get a cutout? They sold those. Oh. You could purchase them. It was 80 bucks. It was 80 bucks for the whole season of football and basketball or I think 50 each uh, if you wanted like a, just one season. And then of a single sport. Who did Larry? Uh, I th- we as a Rifer California staff did one of Larry. Awesome. Um, my gaming buddies and I we did one of Mikey, Mike Toledo. Um, and I think some other people did. You know, there did some ones for Larry and did one for Mikey too. So that's awesome. Yeah, I act, so I, funnily enough that you bring that up is because um. Mikey Toledo's uh, sister reached out to me today on Instagram, and that's who I was texting right before we started recording because she, her mom had apparently through Facebook just was wondering and saw the cutouts that they posted on Facebook. They they literally put like sec they took pictures of sections of cutouts, like I think a few few like rows each, and they put it up on Facebook so you can go find your cutout. Hmm. And I think she was flipping through it and she saw a picture of Mikey. So she wanted to know like who had done that and stuff. And then, so her sister reached out to me. um, And so I was just talking with her all day. um, And yeah, um, it's, it's been a weird year. Um, It's a a year of lost people um, and people that we're never going to forget the rest of our lives. 
but at the same time, um, it's great because at least with Mikey and his family, they've, they've reached out to us and talked about how much they, you know, are, they love how thoughtful we are for it. And I'm just thankful that they see it that way. Um, and they accept everything that, you know, we're just trying to remember them by. So yeah. Um, Mikey, I know you're listening. This for, this one was for you, man. And Larry, I brought them the churros. If you didn't see the picture, I put it up on Twitter. Larry was a big churro guy. He always needed a churro at the game. It was hashtag churro to victory. Uh, Mikey is a big fan of Taco Bell. So in order to honor them both at the first Cal game of this season, I went to Taco Bell and got cinnamon sticks, <laughs> which I think is the only apt crossover of the two worlds. And I ate an entire bag by myself in the in the press box. So just that's, for Larry and Mikey. Yeah, that's awesome. Really, really, really cool. Yeah, sadly, so, uh, the game was not cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In some ways, they were able to not have to watch that. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I think the other uh, tweet. I think the other tweet I saw that was that I laughed a lot was we had three Larry cutouts. So someone said that was Larry in pain three times watching this game. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, definitely apt. Apt yeah. tweet. So uh, what was the yes. press box like? Like, tell us about your experience, Rob. You were mm. one of how many people to attend yeah. the big game. What was the atmosphere like in the stadium? Was it rocking? How was the noise? All right. So y- you want to know, like, how my whole day went. So um, I'll, I'll kind of start from the start, from the beginning. Uh, you get, like, this COVID symptom test checker in the email. You fill that out. You get, like, this thing that says, like, you're cleared to come to the stadium today. You just take a screenshot of that, and you have to actually show that before you enter. I get to the stadium. I get out of my car, and I hear all this noise coming from the stadium. Like, I hear the, and first down bears, and, you know, like, crowd, you know, cheering. I think they were playing around with the sound settings and stuff, uh, you know, prior to it. So I'm hearing all that, and then um, I waited, actually, for Trace of Cal Rivals. And then we walked up to the stadium together, of course, socially distanced six feet and all. Walked up. They changed where the media entrance was. They actually put it on the where the student entrance is. So walked up there. Then you like show them. You get your bag checked first. Like you have to open up everything. Then you show them like the symptom check. You do that. Then you know they they thermometer check you with the little thermometer gun at your forehead. Uh, and then you go into the game uh, like usual. And then you enter onto the concourse. One of the none of the food stalls, of course, are open, right? But one of the food stalls is open, and that's where you get your lunch, like before you head up to the press box. You get like a little box lunch. Got that. Um, and as you're walking, it's what's really cool is that I posted a picture too. Um, I'm, I can't remember on which Twitter account, but I did. Uh, of on the concourse, you know how you know how on the concourse on the like if you're walking through the stadium on one side, it's like all the concession stands. Yep. And then the other side is just like empty space, right? Where they usually have like the ketchup stand or like a you know like a t-shirt stall, things like that. Yeah, merch. since all of that, since all of that is gone, what they've done is they've put chairs there in those in specific little areas, and that's where the units are having their team meetings outdoors, where they can space out, they can use the walls, like they have like a table set up. I think they have projectors set up too. That's kind of the spacing made it look like that's how they have it normally set up. Huh. Um, and it says like O line special teams tight ends, like it it marks it, so you just like walk over to your. Little, oh. little group, which I thought was really neat. Cool. Yeah. Um, go up to the press box. There's about, I'd say probably somewhere between like 30 to maybe 35 people up in the press box on that entire floor in terms of people, like actually people working, like press working. Uh, the Basically how it works is that row that you and I sit on, which is the very front row of press of the press box, that's spaced out six feet between each person with plexiglass in between each each seat. The row behind us on that second level, no one sits. And then that very last row, they did the same thing where it's six feet, six feet plexiglass. Um, and that's pretty much it. And you just sit in your seat. They give you like a little bottle of hand sanitizer too if you, if you need it. Not a lot of game notes or anything. It's just that little flip card, the little turn card that has the names and, and depth chart. 
And uh, yeah, he's watching the game from there per usual, you know, with the internet connection and, and all that. And that's pretty much it. In terms of the game, I mean, you heard, you hear the, the virtual crowd noise. Um, what was really funny is like, you know, when, when big plays happen and you hear like the, the players like yell, you know, or like yell profanities or some other thing, you can hear all of it. <laughs> cause, cause even though there's like sound of the audience being pumped into the stadium, you it, it's not, it doesn't fully cover it. Like you get the noise of an actual, you know, human screaming in the stands. So yeah, you get all of that. You got all of, all of those little moments. Uh, I mean, I think the the funniest and saddest moment, in my opinion, was after the game was over. Stanford's on our field, you know, celebrating their they, their take of the 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 axe back. Um, and there's like crowd noise of like cheering. You know, I think it's just like you know, just regular ambient you know cheering noises. And then all of a sudden, that sound. I they just they just cut it. So it like it like. It like trom- sad tromboned, for lack of a better word, and you know, pun for the big game stuff, is uh <laughs> you just hear the Stanford like team just going, yeah, yeah, like very softly, you know, as they're as they're cheering, and it's just them on the field. There's no one else around the stadium, and the lights are getting dimmer, and it's just them on the field. Like it it was very sad looking. <laughs> like it's it's not the way you would want to celebrate, like taking the axe back. Um, and which Maybe some poetic justice because it is, you know, that type of year that they decided to take the axe back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Poetic justice. I mean, we, we, it's the same justification that I used for the Dodgers winning the World Series. It's like, well, if there's any year for them to win it, it might as well be this one. Because, like an asterisk year. Yeah. Because they didn't get to celebrate in person. You know, let's flip it back to Stanford because I don't want to upset any LA people. So it's just, a, you know, <laughs> reference point, but back to Stanford, they didn't get to celebrate in person. You know, people didn't get to watch together. Those traditions were very different. And you kind of the game ended and um, it definitely sat with me for quite a while. So I didn't get to go about my day, but I also didn't have to deal, you know, the image that is seared into my mind as a Cal fan is the riding on the bus and we would take the bus down. We'd park at Zachary's. We'd get Zachary's Pizza. We'd take the 51 all the way down College. I don't know if it's still called that. Down College Ave and get off and then walk up to the stadium. And then at the home, after the game, we'd walk back. We'd get on the bus with a bunch of Stanford fans. They were always happy because we never won. And I turned to my dad and said, Dad, why does Cal always lose? That is me, you know, <laughs> age five going to the big game <laughs> but that's what's seared into my mind and you know there's no chummy stanford fans that were on the bus there was no day the day after usually i'm traveling going place so you know there's no stanford hats on the flight to hawaii you know the the usual things weren't there and then on top of it because of the way that they won it felt like you know, I mean, if, if you're a Stanford fan, like you have to know you got away with highway robbery. There's no way you're coming out of that being like. It was a it was a smash and grab. Yeah, it was 100 yeah. percent a smash and grab. And I think that, you know, there's been a lot of negativity from Cal fans on this. But, you know, let's not forget. Let's not lose the big picture here. And so here comes my sunshine pumping. So if you don't like sunshine, then maybe not the maybe, you know, just you could just turn the podcast off. <laughs> so. This Cal coaching staff has us in a position where my argument is that we are equal to or better than Stanford every time we play the big game. How that game actually goes is a different story. But as far as from a competition level and expectation level, there's no way you're going to tell me next year that I'm not going to have the expectation that we're winning that game. And the same was said, I could say about this year and the same about last year. And we sort of felt the same the year before that, but that was the first year where we sort of had that confidence going to it. Now it's, it's very much at equilibrium. I think it's balanced and that feels good to me as a Cal fan because of, you know, the whole nine years in a row thing. And so I just don't, 
Yeah, people calling for a lot of change after this game and reacting to things like that. I understand that is painful, but let's look at the let's play the long term here. You know, let's look and and, and just see like how far we've come. Because under Sonny Dykes, it was like we were gonna get run through. I don't know if y'all remember. We were gonna get run through. We brought an amazing team to that game that featured Jared Goff and three future NFL wide receivers, and we got ran through. Like that. <laughs> was how it was going like we were just okay we're gonna play stanford they're gonna roll over us not uh not anymore no way especially this game should have been you can make a good case this game is 27 10 yep. or you know that there are a lot of different ways that cal or you know cal scores a lot of points and stanford scores very little in this game yeah this is more of a game that we lost than a game that stanford won yep and and that i think is the best version of a big game you can ask for outside of a Cal win, right? Because how many years, how many games, how many big games in years past have we just been like, yeah, we lost that game. Like from the start, like we weren't in it whatsoever. It might've looked like we Uh, were in it, but we, we weren't the whole Andrew Luck era, the whole Sonny Dykes era. Right. I mean, what the, even the first year of Wilcox, right? The Ross Bowers, you know, the, the, the pick like that, that was like it. It was that year too. So we were, in that, we were in that game. We were in that game for a little bit, and then and then it 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 got out of hand. No, I think so. I think I don't think we were. I don't think we were competitive towards the end of the game. What yeah. we were at that game? I was with you I in know. the stands. I know you and I were in the stands, and we I lost did, that game. I kindly object, and <laughs> the reason why was because we lost the game. I mean, we had a we had a chance to win the game. Are you right? We were, or we were driving downfield. Ross threw the pick, and then Stanford did the. the they had that thing. long, slow drive, like yeah. twelve minute drive yeah. to. But yes, they seemed over. We see like we were the underdog. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like we were favored in this game. We were, you know, we'll be. Pro- my guess is we'll probably be an underdog next year, but not by much. You know, it's like one of I those. I think it'll like, be a three point things. spread at, at yeah. the most. Yeah, I'm with you. That's the difference. So anyone who's calling for change at any level besides special teams, if you want to call for <laughs> change to special teams, that's fine. Warranted. You also Absolutely can't warranted. call for change at special teams if you're also the same person that's cheering Brett Johnson and the two sacks that he had. So if you're watching Brett Johnson play and celebrating that, and then you're saying, hey, we need to get rid of our special teams coach. Nope, can't do that. Because you can't have your cake and eat it too. Not today. No cake. Either choose cake or no cake. You can't have both. What about pie? Can I choose pie? Dude, I had sweet potato pie for the first time. (laughs) Mind blowing. I had a rum laced pecan pie. Lord have mercy. (laughs) Yeah, Thanksgiving. (laughs) That's right. Happy Thanksgiving to all you folks listening. Uh, I I don't think we mentioned that last week. And last week's technically was the Thanksgiving pod. So, yeah. We should have we should have said happy Thanksgiving last week, but we, we whoosh, it was big game week. It wasn't Thanksgiving week. 2020 has already reshaped how we work, and it's almost over. Businesses across the globe are challenged to be their most efficient, which means every hire is critical. And Indeed is here to help. Indeed is the number one job site in the world with more total visits than any other job site, according to Comscore. Indeed helps you find quality candidates quickly so you can focus on hiring the person you need to keep your business going. Unlike other sites, Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility over your hiring, and you only pay for what you need. You can pause your account at any time, and there are no long-term contracts. And now Indeed's new way of matching you with candidates instantly delivers a short list of quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match your job criteria that you can contact the moment you sponsor a job, making Indeed the only job site that can move as fast as you do. Right now, Indeed is offering our listeners a free $75 credit to boost your job posts, which means more quality candidates will see it and fast. Try Indeed out with a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. This is their best offer available anywhere. Go right now to Indeed.com slash BlueWire. That offer is valid through December 31st. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you. 
Football is back in full swing. Kind of, not really, mainly not. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on every possible chance to win this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than anywhere else. Can we, and I ask you this, Rob, can we please see if Bet Online has odds on whether or not the game this week will be canceled due to COVID? We'll see. You can get in on their season opening bonuses today and start off wagering on wins, divisions, and championship futures all day, every day. Head to Bet Online today and take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Don't forget to use the promo code BLUEWIRE at betonline.ag. That's BLUEWIRE, all one word. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Um, all right. We already started talking about the game, but let's let's get into the real thick of this game. All right. Let me let me run you through a little bit of what happened. The 123rd big game, one, two, three, and the Bears lose the axe to Stanford 24 to 23 off of a missed PAT to end the game, pretty much. Um the Bears actually took a pretty nice lead. Um you know, they scored seven in the first quarter, then three, Stanford scored 10. So I guess it was 10-10 it was at the half. And then Bears start making this furious comeback, uh, and it falls short. The Some stats of note here is uh, Chase Garbers, 19 of 29, 151 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Uh, Damian Moore, 10 rushes, 121 yards. I know Andy has a lot to say about Damian Moore. Uh, Chase Garbers, 13 rushing attempts with 51 yards uh that's not sack adjusted so uh take of that what you will marcel dancy who actually got the start seven carries for 42 yards and from a pass catching standpoint kiko crawford five catches 52 yards on nine targets or one touchdown excuse me and nico remigio two catches for two yards one touchdown four targets from the stanford side david mills davis david mills or davis mills davis mills davis davis mills uh, 24 of 32, 205 yards, one touchdown rushing Austin Jones, 21 attempts, 85 yards, two touchdowns. And yeah. Eh. And then Stanford <laughs> Wilson, uh, Wilson had seven catches for 88 yards and a touchdown defensively. The bears, of course, led by coin dang 40, uh, 40, 14 total tackles, eight solo and a tackle for loss. Brett Johnson, 10 total tackles, three solo, one sack and one tackle for loss. And then Josh Drayden, uh, seven tackles, three solo, half a tackle for a loss, and a pass breakup. Those were pretty much your guys of the game. Actually, the other big guy of the game was uh, J.H. Tevis, who had four total tackles, two solo, two sacks, and two tackles for loss on the game. Pete my high, baby. Pete my high, yes. Represent. Also, <laughs> also from the overseas, can speak three, I think, for three different languages or four different languages. Um, third culture kid, just like I am. Some some notes here before I hand it off to Andy to talk about the rest of the game. Uh, Cal scored on the opening drive, capped by Chase Garbers, connecting with Kiko Crawford for a seven-yard touchdown. It was Crawford's second touchdown of the season and the fourth of his career. Cal has now scored on all three of its opening drives this season. Field goal at UCLA and touchdown at Oregon State, and now another touchdown against Stanford. Damian Moore's 54-yard run was the longest player of scrimmage of this season and the longest since Chris Brown had a run of 54 yards in the Red Box Bowl. Moore ended the day with a career high 121 rushing yards on 10 carries, good for his first 100 yard rushing performance. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from Trace, he put out on his on the Cal Rivals Twitter that this would be he's the first true freshman to do it since Marshawn Lynch in 2004, also against Stanford in terms of over 100 yards rushing. Um, some last notes here. Cal's 241 rushing yards were the most since compiling 305 against Oregon State in 2018. J.H. Tevis notched his first sack of the year and his first multi-sack game of his career. Uh, Brett Johnson also totaled a career 10 high tackles, surpassing his previous best of five tackles in last year's big game. He added a sack as well. Um, Chris Brown Jr. secured his first rushing touchdown of the season and the 10th of his career in the fourth quarter. 
and this is a fun stat, there have now been 56 big games out of the 123 that have finished with a seven point differential or less. Pretty interesting. Little note there. Uh, but let's get into it. Andy, I need your thoughts on this game, man. We talked about the coaching. We talked about the big picture stuff. Let's talk about this game. This game in a nutshell, yeah. I think I said on Twitter, was super, super annoying. <laughs> <laughs> as far as like football games go, I don't know if you could find anyone that you could just clearly define more annoying than this one. The frustration from the special team side of things that I had – was palpable and then on top of it it just sort of felt like cal couldn't get out of their own way you know with the dancy fumble or the you know elijah hicks grabbing the guy on it you know davis mills looking that receiver that he throws the ball to where daniel scott makes interception like he's he's only going there like i i don't i don't care if elijah hicks was beat on that play it didn't matter you know, like normally you're like, okay, like hold on to him, I guess, if you think you're going to give up a big play. Nope, that wasn't it. Davis Mills was looking only one direction. That ball was going to be picked off. So, yeah, it's, it's frustrating, man. I don't know. Like it's the – what do you say about this game? It's the epitome of 2020? It really is. If you were to take 2020 in a nutshell, put it into a football game, be like, hey, watch this. This will tell you about the year 2020. You'd be like, oh, shit, which which team are you? Oh, no, 2020 was Cal. That, <laughs> that, that, that team. <laughs> That's Missed what that game PAT. I was having this conversation on the live stream with uh, Nick and Avi, and I asked them, "What's what's like the the football version of like hitting for a cycle, right? Like on offense and on defense." And then I and then I and then I immediately after that missed PAT at the end of the game, I told them that that is the cycle of special team misses because last week you had a blocked punt, this week you have a blocked field goal and a blocked PAT. I think that's the cycle of, of and a muffed punt, and a muffed could, punt. Could you have a blocked kickoff? <laughs> Is that even possible? <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, it's it's the it's the cycle of special teams. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so super. I mean, it's it's really it was hard hard to find words to describe. The amount of frustration. I legitimately think my neighbors were concerned. I had the sliding glass door open with the, you know, with the screen on. And when we missed the, I think I tweeted the 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 exact words, the PAT. I just said, a fucking course. But at, (laughs) (laughs) just screamed it. And then just let out this huge, like, angry yell. And I'm sh- like, Diana was watching the game with me and rooting for Cal, which is just amazing that she does that. And <laughs> she's just looking at me like, oh boy. She's like, are you all right? I'm like, nope, not okay. <laughs> not even gonna lie. Nope, not good. I, how, I mean, how were, how did you contain that emotion knowing that you couldn't express it? In the environment that you're in, I tweeted. I tweeted out uh, on the right for California Cal because I was I was just tweeting out like just emotions as they happened, right? Because I can't feel emotion elsewhere. <laughs> and I wrote like, guys, it's cold. Like, I'm scared. Should I should I head towards the light? I see a light. Should I head, should I head towards it? And that's kind of that's kind of how I felt because immediately after I scored the touchdown, right? I see on Twitter everyone's like, all right, should we go for two? Or, you know, like, or should we take it to overtime? Like, do you think we're going to be okay in overtime? And in my head, I, I kid you not, in my head, I'm thinking, let's get through this PAT first. Can we can we please get through this PAT first? Because we've got our first field goal block field goal blocked. I'm not overly happy and like, you know, optimistic about our chances here. And then what you see, and I, I remember seeing this in real time, is you see the Stanford defense or the special teams line up and overload the right side of Cal's field goal unit. Yeah. The exact same setup that they had for the blocked field goal attempt to end the half. And we have all three of our timeouts. 
and you clearly see they're overloaded on one side, you don't call the timeout to adjust? Like, I'm so confused. I, like, do yeah. you have the trust in your guys to do it? Or you saw what happened early in the game. Take the timeout. Talk to your guys. Be like, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to do the same thing over again. We're not going to let it happen. Right? And readjust and then go kick the field goal. If they come out and they realign straight, then okay, just go with the normal the normal routine that you've been doing. But up until that point, like you got to be prepared for it. They clearly weren't. The right side of the line gets overloaded. There might be there might be an argument there for some foul call because they stepped on one of the guys to get that that boost over the top. You could make that argument. But in the in the like mix of like all these offensive linemen and defensive linemen and all these other people like mashing in, in, in at the line, like I don't think they're gonna call that. And then so you have the the blocked PAT um to to somewhat end the game because we didn't really end the game there. We tried using all our timeouts to get the ball back, but to no avail. So that's the so let's I mean that's where we let's start here. And work our PAT. way back. Yeah. I agree entirely. It was the most obvious thing ever. It was the most obvious thing. I do not know. So while I can acknowledge that using a time a time oh my gosh, time out there is incredibly costly because if you do miss the PAT, then you don't have an ability of really getting the ball back at all. Right. So I un- so there's that the other thing I think that does exist too is by calling a timeout there, are you then in, in an essence icing yourself? Are you creating more mm. pressure for the moment because you're telling your guys, hey, you know, we needed an extra timeout for something that will – how many times are you going to call a timeout on a PAT? So I think maybe there's something to that and being like, go out, execute. We trust you to execute. We don't need to talk this over. But if I'll be damned if I'm like Angus McClure and I'm not w- coming up to every single one of those O-linemen before that play and I'm being like, you all, this is one play and you need to block like your literal life dependent on it. You know, and I just, I don't know. But I, what I do know was that it was the ob- most obvious thing ever. They overloaded that side of the football. It was very clear we didn't have the <laughs> offensive linemen on that side or blockers to like it was a numbers game we didn't have numbers to block all those guys and we just were like run it (laughs) was like what (laughs) and i was like it's the einstein thing man it's like doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result it's the it was insanity if it was the first time it happened in that game i wouldn't be as upset it's the fact that they did the same thing twice and that's, I think, what you're trying to you're trying to get at too. We saw it happen in the the freaking field goal to end the half. Yeah. So I think if you're upset, that's the place where my anger exists. If you can't tell, you know, that's where my frustration exists. Is with this play, it felt one. I think you know. I said get six, go for two. But you, as you look with the time on the clock that was left situationally. You know, we weren't the underdog. I It's like, I'm not going to beat anybody up for not making that call, but I do think it sure as hell would have sat a lot better with me right now. In hindsight. Mm-hmm. Right. Than going for the tie and not making it happen. I think uh, if, and, if we were at Stanford, I would have said go for go for two. I think Just if go, we were on the road, we would have gone for two. We would have gone for two. I But in my opinion... At least for me, I'm not upset with the call. The call is not what I'm upset with. The call to get the kick the PAT and not kick the field goal because statistically, I think like, we would have won. We would have won. I think we would have won in overtime. overtime. Statistically, like we we were we were on fire. Like even offensively, look, um, average yards per play, Cal six, Stanford four point five. Average yards per uh, or average yards per rush, Cal six point nine. Stanford 2.7. All right. Even even if you go sack adjusted, Cal goes 8.5 and Stanford goes 3.8 rushing. Right? It 
st- the statistics just show that we were definitely the better team on the field that day. And Stanford, we shot ourselves in the foot. And then right at the last minute, Stanford completed the smash and grab. Yeah. I mean, so how do you lose a game where you statistically dominate in that way? Well, you lose a turnover margin. Yep. Like, and that's the, the funniest thing about because we know Wilcox, like his philosophy is to win the turnover margin. That's really what they want to do. That's how they turnover believe. margin, explosive, explosive plays, plays. And, and uh, what was the third one? There's, yeah, one other. Is it? I don't know. Tackling. <laughs> It's either that or like havoc place or like pressure something maybe maybe some of, one of those three but the two big ones turnover margin and um, yeah yeah so so turnover margin super frustrating particularly that you know the play with Nico it, the ball gets between like Cam Bynum like Cam has a pretty legit chance to kind of get down on the football. If he slides on top of it, but instead yeah, he, he goes for the scoop, yeah, and you know that's they teach you not to do that. So that was that's a bummer. And then uh, Marcel Dancy, the fumble, just grinding. You know, he was clearly bouncing on kind of off of guys. And then in that scenario, I don't, you know, it was a really good play by the Stanford defender. Uh, mm-hmm. on that football yeah he punched it out like yeah I, I don't know if you have even super proper technique if that ball if you get that good of a punch in on a football like that how many times it's gonna stay stay there but you know it's just mistakes like this kind of happen and um and it are in this game it seemed like they kind of happen and they really shouldn't yeah um uh, so ouch but let's talk about a quick positive because I don't want to wait on it any longer. Sure. This dude, Damian Moore, my goodness. <laughs> Is it too soon to call him mini Marshawn? Because I already did. <laughs> this guy, if you are a Cal fan and you are not excited about the future of Damian Moore, who is someone that the most exciting thing for me watching him is not the big plays. Those are awesome. But the most exciting thing for me was that stiff arm. That stiff arm was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. And he sheds tacklers like the Arrington, Marshawn, Shane Vereen, Forset guys did. And he can run behind the tackles. We gotten used to these guys that are fast and speedy and get to the outside like Bigelow, but really couldn't hit between the tackles, get those tough runs. Man, Davian Moore can do that. Oh, and he can shed tackles. I am so excited that we get to have this free year for him. And maybe we can look back on this podcast and be like, yeah, we lost that game and that really sucked. But then we had the emergence of a running game behind a player that we've been badly wanting back at Cal for a long time. Yeah. Just a game breaker type of running back, right? Like that's the type of running back we've missed the last however many years. We haven't had that guy. And, you know, I'm a little upset. He didn't get to break off that 54 yard run for a touchdown. He just got caught by the safety. Um, But, you know, the safety made a good play. You know, he didn't crash in too hard and he, you know, floated out and ran towards him. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. Damian Moore was definitely a positive. There's a lot of po- there's still a lot of positives to take away from this game. I, I think I think there are we do need to talk about that. Uh, but let's just get like all the negative stuff out of the way, right? Okay, uh, back to the negative. Back to the negative. Punting it was a nice. It was a nice oh, yes, God. punting. Where's Jasper? I swear, <laughs> get Jasper on the phone. <laughs> this guy comes on our prediction pod, tells us all about this new punter, and I could not be more disappointed. And that's as far as I'm going to go because I'll say something too strong. But what in the hell? Yeah, um, that hasn't been great. Uh, <laughs> punting, uh, Jameson Chan, six punts for a net of 245 yards, an average of 40.8. Um, only one of his kicks were 50 plus yards. None of his kicks were inside the 20. And I'm pretty sure one of his kicks netted netted 32 yards. 
Yeah, that really bad one. Yeah, yeah, the one that, the one that shanked. Um, but yeah, he is. He is. It feels like. He, it, I don't know what it is, but it feels like he's been rattled. Like he, it's, it doesn't look like he's kicking with any confidence. No, and the way he punts, like he runs into the, like he. Yeah, he runs straight into the. He like takes a lead into the blocker. Lead into the blocker. So when he's kicking, the trajectory of the ball is going very low. Yeah, and it's barely missing, guys. <laughs> so it's like giving me a heart attack every time we punt. And then on top of it, what Stanford did was really smart. Was I think they figured out like, hey, this guy is really good when the ball bounces. They didn't let any of them bounce, so they caught all of them, and it got zero rolls. And so this whole thing of, well, if it had bounced, well, they caught it. So it, I don't care what if it bounced. I don't know where it's going to bounce. All I got was the person catching it. So that argument doesn't really hold a lot of water with me. Absolutely. So, yeah, I've been super disappointed in our ability to get field position. And we saw how important that was with Stanford. Stanford plays it to, to potentially and probably most likely a fault. They play the the field position game, but you know we we saw how un like how tough it was for us to move the ball when we were pinned down in the twelve five four. You know we had all these horrible starting field position, and Stanford in the meantime had really good starting field position, and that had a huge impact. We lost a game. We uh, the thing that uh, this the one stat that pisses me off is we lost this game when Stanford punted inside our thirty five. Did they also like punt from the forty or something, Jersey? Yeah. Or it was, or like was two. what was it? Like was two, it two? two hand away? Yeah. I mean, one of them was that like fake. It like they tried to put their quarterback out there to make it look like we were doing like they were doing a wildcat play to their number zero quarterback, but then it was like that fake, and then they they kicked it to the corner, and the wide receiver like caught it perfectly, like right within the five. It was well played. It was very well played. It was a, that was a very very smart. Um, play to make but yeah punting definitely needs work i i don't know man like we there's just a lot of things that needs to be adjusted for the special teams and i'm i believe wilcox said that too there's a lot of things that needs to be fixed and we need to get on that right away um i hope maybe this week they finally get it but there's also like so many things that have led up to this game right Stanford gets their game canceled, not because Stanford had issues with their COVID test, but who they were playing. And because of that, Stanford had a full team, basically a bye week, right, to prep for our game without having to play uh, without losses versus like us where, you know, even like the first week when we played, when we didn't play against Washington and then we tried to play against UCLA, even then we were missing guys up until the day of the game in terms of practicing. And then we lost more guys heading into Oregon State. And those guys still weren't able to play this game. Hopefully, they'll be able to play next game. But it's just a lot of like weird things that have happened over the last few weeks that like have just piled piled up, 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 up against this team. You know, like, yeah. Um, when we, well, I'll, I'll get to this when we get to the positives. But, yeah, the punt game definitely was an issue. The one question I had for you, right, is I know you've talked about how, you know, offense turtling. Right, that's a big thing that you you emphasize, and that's something that you don't want our offense to. Do you feel like the offense turtled in this game, or do you think they actually played a pretty complete game? I think Damian Moore's success on the ground kind of was a band aid over what I would call like a larger that the uh, issues with the offense still not really clicking. Mm-hmm. I think Chase still misses passes. You know, it was clear they showed a stat that he was like 0 for 4 on passes of 20 yards or more. And then I think right after that, he airmailed a wide open receiver in the end zone for the game, potential game tying touchdown. And he was open. I think it was Nico, actually. That was, um, or is it Nico pa- or Makai? It was Makai. Yeah. Okay. If it's the, if yeah. he throws that touchdown to Makai down the sideline, I think it's game over. Yeah. So I, I think that he is still just not totally hitting those. And then I also was frustrated. It's kind of twofold. One, you know, Garber's, I think just working on 
more long downfield throws. But the other was that I felt like we weren't using his legs. It was like clearly working. It felt like, you know, very similar reaction. I had an emotional reaction to it, very similar to watching Andrew Luck roll out against us on Memorial and just use his legs to win that big game. And I just felt like we could have done more, but we went pretty run. We, you know, we went run heavy. That's why I feel like we got bailed out by, Dam- you know, the emergence of Damian Moore in what was otherwise just another performance where we scored, what, like 23 points. <laughs> it's like, we've talked about it all year long. Like we need to hit thirties. Like this Cal defense is resetting at cr- critical positions and they played super well in this game. They did. And, um, and to hold an opponent to 24 points, that's pretty damn good. Especially the, given the field position that Stanford had all football game long. And for us to be only be able to put up 20, you know, 23 should have been 24 felt disappointing. So, and it's also seeing things like we have, we'll get the ball, like we would roll into like the 10 and then we struggle from the 10 on in. I don't know if you've seen that. I feel like we just, even in the play that really opened up everything, it's like, you know, we had to do the, that was an amazing draw play to Chris Brown Jr. I thought that was incredible. But still, I just sort of feel like the offense kind of loses itself when we get closer to the end zone. So I think that's something to watch out for. This is not there yet. We have the positives. We have Damian Moores. We have the emergence of Kakoa Crawford. We have the emergence of Makai Polk. Like continued emergence of these players getting better and these progressions. And it's very exciting to see that. But at the same time, like it's still too inconsistent of an offense for us right now where it's like we could go three and out really fast or we can have a long sustained drive. And I think that's something that we need to focus on. Yeah, I think... uh... I think you raised some good points, um, particularly about like the fact that we just dis- we just go three and out just because it's clear what type of plays we want to run, and if they don't work, then it's just back kind of like the back to the drawing board type of moment of like, all right, we'll get them on the next drive. When in realistically, we don't have that margin for error to go back to the drawing board. Like every drive, particularly against Stanford, because they play such a slow style of game, we're not going to get those many drives. We're not going to have that extra drive that we would normally get in a normally paced, you know, maybe with another spread spread team because they're not throwing the ball that often. Um, And, you know, they're running the ball, trying to keep the clock on their side. And that's, that's kind of how they roll. Like I think uh, I tweeted this out about how we haven't, we seem to have not increased the margin for error for this team which you need to do with such a young offensive team and the defense played out of their minds. The once the one uh, tweet that I saw trace, put on Cal rivals that I was shocked Cal's defense only played 14 players total. And eight of those 14 played all 69 snaps on defense. That is, that is insane. I don't know what that speaks to. Does that speak to a lack of depth? Does that speak to a lack of like, not trusting the younger guys to play. But then I look at the roster breakdown and I'm like, all right, let's look at outside linebacker, for example, right? Like Braxton Croto was not able to play this game. That leaves Cam good, right? For sure. And then I believe Curly Young is out for the year, which means Miles Jernigan and Orrin Patu are the only other two uh, scholarship outside linebackers that are on the roster. The rest are all uh, walk-ons. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, and so there's so and then of course nose guard we're, we don't have anyone, <laughs> um, and so Brett is playing there, and then even at defensive end it's like you have the guys that you saw like Tevis and and Ziande, um, but beyond that it's like there's we don't have guys there we don't have we don't have like the depth of scholarship guys there which I think is is huge. So yeah, and to and. You know, Avi Avi made a good point in our right for California Slack, which is like, and even despite that, the defense was arguably our best unit on the field the most of the game. Like we had moments with the offense, but defensively, I think we played a really pretty sound game. Yeah. No. Across the board. Um, well, I think Avi put out the stat where it's like Cal's Cal in that game only let or defense wise only let 10 points unassisted off of turnovers. 
It's like all the rest of the points came off of when we either turned the ball over from a muff punt or, you know, like a fumble or a special teams play. And yeah, that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it went. Uh, I sort of look at this season as, you know, just being one, one, it's like, how much do we actually, I, I really don't know how much I, like I, on the defensive side of things, I think like we have good players that are coming in as freshmen that can make an impact. And so I think as, a, as it was pointed out in, in the right for Cal Slack, like I think, yeah, maybe they focused in on this game and said, Hey, like this is a must win. We need to keep the ax and good for the coaches understanding the importance that that holds among both players and the fans. And so that their decision there was just maybe to go, but I think it also is just like a matter of circumstance, Mm -hmm. you know, more so than anything else. It's harder. I mean, I don't have any issues with the defense. I really don't. I didn't have that high of expectations for the season. I didn't think we're going to continue to be able to hold that elite level status as a defense this year, resetting at so many different positions you see the holes that Evan Weaver is not filling. It's very obvious. <laughs> it's like very easy. It's like, oh, Evan Weaver would have been there. Like that dude was everywhere. <laughs> like cannot emphasize how important he was to the defense. And then on top of it to have all world and all world secondary, you know, and the plays that we got beat on, like, yeah, you had Cam Bynum one-on-one with the receiver and he got beat. I will take it. That the coaches will take it. That's why that play was called. They were a, they put him out on an island and said, "Cam, we trust you." And look, like he got beaten. That happens. Happens to the corners in the NFL. Like nobody out there is truly, truly shut down. You know, outside of the very, very best. And usually, when they get that good, they're only good for a season. You know, I think about like Darrell Revis, or I think about Richard Sherman, or I look at you know some of these guys that get all this hype, and then it's like kind of come and go super fast. It's hard to be that good. So yeah, no issues on defense. I still think there's room for improvement on offense. I hope that this doesn't have any implications on our recruiting class because it's really good. And I just want to make sure that at this point, like it's all damage control from here. So we have Oregon coming up. I My big question to you, Rob, is, is there a win left on the schedule? Because I'm looking at 0-5 and, and being like, yeah, it's very possible. I... I think that's well within the possibility. I could also see us winning our final two games. Like I like seeing how Oregon lost this past week, I'm like anything can happen really in the Pac-12 this year, right? Like literally everything is up for grabs. I I don't feel like any any game was like a true true blowout. I think the only game I think maybe might have been a true true blowout is probably the the Colorado UCLA game that happened our, in week 1. Our UCLA game. <laughs> But does that really count as a blowout when, like, you know, I, I think, okay, it, in the sense that, like, two teams both had, like, ample time to re- prepare. I did feel like going into that game, it was going to be one, one team is, was just going to dominate, and it was most likely going to be UCLA because they had played a game the week before, and they're a little bit more in game shape, and we're, like, you know, putting our defensive line in a quarantine on a plane to try and fly them out to play a game. So, you know... <laughs> There are other circumstances uh, leading up to it, but you know people are going to say that that's an excuse, and I think I think it's a valid excuse. Uh, but if you don't think so, I think that's a perfectly valid opinion as well. Uh, you know, so I think the the thing about the offense that you talked about, um, one thing that I'm, and this is the positive side, the one thing that I'm hopeful for after watching that Stanford game was our play calling got a little bit more diversified, right? Like, have we ever run a speed option before? I, I was like, what? <laughs> we have that in the playbook? We have a speed option in the playbook? And then we have like those like where it's like a trips, trips left, close, close, basically attached to the line. And it's like a fake pitch to the left where the three, where the three guys or the trips are your like outside blockers. I thought that was a really cool play design. I was really, really stoked about that play. I asked Burke 18. Uh, on Twitter to be like, hey, can you break that play down for me? Because uh, <laughs> I really yeah. like that play design. Because um, it looks like a, it looks like one of the run. It looks like a pass play. It kind of looks like the pass plays that they've set up over the last couple of games. Because you've seen that formation 
But then now you see that little pitch play and now there people are going to have to, you know, uh, decide whether they think it's going to be a pitch run or, you know, trips wide out running routes. So I think there was a lot to take from it. I, 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 as I said, like in the after the UCLA game, it's the only way I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, Musgrave, uh, yeah, maybe not a fit in college is if the play calling from the UCLA game was it. Like that was that was the top of the mountain in terms of what we could do. But it was clear. It's clear now. Every single game, the playbook opens up a little more. Every single game, the playbook gets a little bit more diversified. The play calling gets a little bit more diversified. The personnel groupings get a little bit diversified. The formations get a little bit more diversified. Um, so I'm not. I really won't judge this offense until the end of the season, and maybe not even until the start of next season, to get a full grasp of what this playbook is, what they're trying to accomplish, um, and what they're trying to do. Because let's be clear, we missed three offense starting offensive linemen, right? We missed. And then Safel going down against Oregon State, we basically had four guys missing. And then those three guys were still missing going into this game. And out of the five, I can tell you this for a fact, when the team was going for that field goal attempt to end the half, three out of the five offensive linemen stayed on the field for that field goal attempt. So it's clear we're lacking bodies that they're going to have to to double dip and do both. And if that's the case... Who, who made this point? Um, I can't remember who made this point, but it was a great point about how could it be that because these backup, you know, offensive linemen who usually play special teams had to play snaps with the first team offense, did that take away from their time and getting in those practice reps of playing on special teams? Maybe, maybe. Um, so, the, f- the positive spin on this is that going into this Oregon game, we have, if everyone is healthy, we have pretty much a nine deep rotation of offensive linemen now <laughs> that all have starting experience against pretty good teams. Yeah. So I'm all right with that <laughs> moving forward. The season needs to be continued to like, look at the things that you're talking about, which are the positives. And how do you build off of that? And I think that if you look at the first drive against Stanford, what you said, the fact that we scored on every single opening drive, there's clearly something about this offense that works and it works really well when it's executed mm-hmm. well. Yeah. And then there's also aspects of it that, yeah, that has issues. And I think getting O-line experience is probably one of the biggest, most important things for us because if we can come into next season with an experienced offensive line and know that we're going to retain all of this talent on offense – for a full season, as long as they don't decide to go to the NFL. This is an offense that's starting to feature people in a really way that we haven't seen at Cal in a long time. Like Kukoro Crawford's film will be shown to recruits and been like, look at this dude. He's balling right now. You know, like but Kai Polk. Yeah. What's the second year? <laughs> balling right now. You know, Demi and Moore, freshman, balling right now. 120 yards. Like there's players that can step into this offense and produce and produce early. And Bo Baldwin did not like to do that with the young guys. Mm -hmm. That was his thing. He wanted to go with much more of the senior guys. And like, we got a lot of the same dudes over and over and over again. We got to see Vic Wharton more than I ever would want to see Vic Wharton. Sorry, Vic, if you listen to the show, (laughs) but (laughs) you know, there's, there's things that we can build some positive momentum on. I don't know if we're going to be able to handle a team like Oregon right now, to be honest. Like I think we'll make it competitive. I just don't have the expectation that we'll win. Right. I think Washington state is really that game where I'm like, okay, like I think we can win that game. And I'm sitting here kind of being like, ah, 2020 is such a crazy year. We've had so many different random variables happen to us. Or it's like, dude, if we go on five, like whatever, man. Like, I just don't care. <laughs> like, I just, it's just not the year to care. And I think we've said that every time. Like, if there's a year to not care, like, this is the one. Like, just, I know, like, in the game, I trust me, I'm with you. I care a lot. When the game is happening, it's like, I tell myself, don't care. And then, like, two minutes in the game, I'm like, I care a lot. Yeah. You know, and then I care for that period of time. But then I really try to just, like, not care as much after yeah. as I would normally do it. And I think that's important for us here. And, like, it just sucks because it has the implication 
of the axe. It would have been great if this game could have taken a hiatus from the axe element and been played and just in the spirits of it and been like, hey, this is... But, you know, it doesn't make for as good TV. Yeah. <laughs> I think... I mean, you're right. You're right, right? Um, we're playing seven games this season. What bearing does a seven-game season have on a real season? We're playing five. We're playing six. No. Yeah. Our game was canceled. What game? We're playing six? No, because we Washington played... Game. No, no, after the Washington State game. Remember, there's that cross-divisional game to end the season? Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, so we're we're playing six at the very least. So, and then potentially a bowl game. <laughs> That's what's going to win five. All right, well, potentially whatever. a bowl game, right? So, oh, so we would have to win all three. We can go. Well, no, there's no there's no minimum requirement or win percentage requirement for the bowl game this year because yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll there's not a, there's like not enough teams playing. So just we'll go in with zero wins. Yeah, we could we could <laughs> we could potentially go to a bowl game with zero wins. <laughs> and get a ring oh i love it give me that give me that that's awesome that's my new expectation folks lose every game go to a bowl game and win we don't lose bowl games here that's it that's our mantra we don't lose bowl games except for that one time in arizona but we don't talk about that game anymore <laughs> if anything it's become a cult classic oh as i have a box of <laughs> uh, cheese it's sitting right next to me um <laughs> Damn it. I'm starving. Those look great. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, do you have any more positives uh, to end end this uh, conversation about this, the big game with? <sighs> I mean, I think we've talked about all the negatives we can possibly think about. Um, the defensive line, huge positive. Tavis, huge positive. Big guy, moves well, pushes people back. The D-line being able to, I mean, look, the D-line got run down a little bit there in the second quarter i want to say they're mm-hmm. like they're getting tired these guys are going to get tired it's just not as you said like it's just a thin rotation 14 guys yeah <laughs> if it's 14 right. guys playing against a run heavy offense they're going to get exhausted but brett johnson's an absolute monster yep. you know i think coin dang's looked better in every game he's played this year mm-hmm. and so he's getting better chigozi i was super glad he didn't get called out on the targeting review because you know it didn't look like it targeting at all and he's been really solid too so i think that like we're seeing that what will be the next generation you know for the most part behind brett johnson and some of the guys that are coming up and getting playing time like chigozi like chiggy and brett johnson that there's a lot of a, a great future there to build around so defensively i feel good like i just think that this year is a a little bit of a transition for us and going forward very excited I think special te- special teams, like we can talk about this. So let's talk about Ragel. Ragel has been the most pivotal recruiter for us in the state of Arizona and in large part has been in on some of the bigger recruits that we've had with this program. And so if, I if think, not the most pivotal recruiter on the staff. If yeah, a hundred percent. So if you're going to evaluate his performance and say that somebody needs to fire to be fired, please take everything into account. Don't just make it about special teams performance. And oh, by the way, I was working with the team under Coach Alomar. So I lived through that shit front row. (laughs) So I know what it's like to have someone that isn't a good special teams coach. Regal has been a good coach until like we've had, I've had zero special teams issues that I can remember until now. Well, you I had some hope. issues with field goal kicking last year. I don't really have field goal. Yeah, but like I haven't had the field goal kicking is so hit and miss. You know, it's like it depends. I, yeah, the kicker. Yeah. But with the fundamentals of special teams, kick coverage, uh, you know, like I think like punt Starting return, position, punt return, kick yeah. returns, there just weren't a lot of non positive plays. And this season, we've seen a ton of non-positive plays. Yeah. You know, how much is that? Because it's not Ashton and Davis back there. And he was just, you know, rock solid as can be. And it's not Jalen Hawkins back there, former wide receiver. You know, that helps. You know, is it, uh, you know, Nico still being young? Is it Nico feeling desperate like he has to need to make a play? Nico is also it, ran two back, but he got yeah. both two called back. Now we got oh. penalties on that. You know, it's just sloppy play, but it's just... It is what it is. Like we haven't had 
a fall camp. We keep going back to the same arguments for it, but it's like, <laughs> true. it's true. It's like, this is the third game of the season. This always happens early in the season. The problem is we're playing Stanford in the third game of the season. And that doesn't happen. Like that's the issue here is that you're playing in a game that has incredible meaning at a time when most teams are still prone to mistakes. Most of the time when we go to play Stanford, we are in the middle of a grind. We're like eight weeks in. At a high level of execution. Mm -hmm. So those type of mistakes don't happen. So to see it in the third game, or that's your this is your non-conference schedule. Like look at our non-conference play. We haven't had clean games in the old miss game wasn't a clean game. We didn't have a clean game against like Davis. Any of our, David, North Texas, yeah, North Texas. We have we could give you countless examples of that. So, I, I I think it's crazy that I'm hearing people say that they want Wilcox gone. Like absolutely nuts. And I actually think it reflects really, really poorly on our fan base that we have people that are saying that. So as you, if you're out there doing that, just know that you represent Cal and that we have higher standards than that. Secondly, Andy's coming with the fire today. Oh. Oh. Looking at <laughs> looking at Regal, douse myself in water. Thing. I think yeah, I'm running out. <laughs> I'm, running out of, I'm running out of water, man. I'm running out of water. You got to you got to keep, keep finishing these uh, fire takes. I just am not a big fan of letting go of people based on short term kind of reactions, and not a big fan of like rotating coaches in and out like a Texas. Because look at Texas. Is it any fun to be Texas rotating your head coach every four years? I don't think so. Is it any fun to be at SC and like calling for Clay Helton's head every single season? I don't think so. I We have a good thing here. And I this game, like once again, big picture here, we are competitive and in this game. So, I mean, maybe it's my own optimism that's binding me, but I would absolutely not call for Regal to be fired. I don't even particularly think that I, you know, need too much. I'm scared of Wilcox saying we're, I mean, they're going to focus on it, but like, I want them to keep focusing on the things that really matter to me, like the offense and continuing to see how that can develop. As you said, like building out that playbook. Yeah. I think um, I'll, I'll play, I'll play for just because the people are listening, there's going to be a variety of, of uh, opinions. I'll play devil's advocate here. Right. For me, the only way I can uh, rationalize, the firing of Regal on top of, or the moving on from Regal after all of this happened or the last two games, three games is this is, as you said, we have seen, we haven't seen any negative plays from Regal the last three years, right? We also haven't seen any positives at all from a special team standpoint, right? Whether it be punt returns, kick returns, field position, it hasn't been it hasn't been a weapon of ours. Like people teams aren't scared of us. Remember the thing I talked about was like when Nico ran those two back, um, even though they were called back, now teams have to respect Nico because he it's it's on tape now that he has the ability to run those back. We haven't had that since Trevor Davis. We haven't had that type of have that type of dude who can do it. Clearly now that's there, but that's besides the point. The point I'm trying to make is we haven't seen any improvement in that regard, which means if it's a trajectory standpoint, you know, like the defense has like gone up, right? The offense had a little dip, but it feels like it's going on up a little bit. It feels like special teams has flatlined for close to three and a half years now. And so, and then you're seeing this dive off a cliff in terms of performance over a two game period. Is that enough reason to, to move on? Maybe. Um, I, I would still at least wait till the end of the season and see if he can turn this around. But I think if you're making that claim, I think that's probably the only claim you can make from a special teams coaching perspective. That's, as you said, you have to take, you have to be willing to, to part with his recruiting ability in the state of Arizona to do so. And which, what, what outweighs it? Is it the recruits that you're, that he's pulling in like the Kai Milner's, the Brett Johnsons, the Braden Romes, like it is giving that up good enough. Um, and does that improving special teams outweigh that? That's the call for Wilcox to make, right? But I think that's 
that's my devil's advocate version of this, of how I would be able to rationalize the letting go of, of Regal. I think that's all fair. And I appreciate that perspective as well. Yeah. And that can, those can coexist in a world. Absolutely. Yeah. As we said, this is a, this is a fan podcast. All opinions are respected here. We might not agree, but it's, it's your opinion and it's a genuine opinion. So you can have that respected. I think that's perfectly fine. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. End this thing. Let's end this We're thing. Done. Man. We're done with this game. Talking about this game. I don't want to talk about Stanford the anymore. The second me. version of the pandemic. We can go rewatch the game. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Why would I do that to myself? <laughs> Just kidding. We can go rewatch the 2019 big game. Why why would you do that to yourself? Like why <laughs> why honestly, honestly, all I'm gonna remember from this game whenever I see this on television or like someone reminds me of the 2020 big game, I'll be like, I just remember being cold in the press box. I just remember being freezing, even with like a thick parka on. Like I just remember being cold. And it's not only it's not gonna get any easier because we're playing Oregon this week at 4 p.m., which means the sun is going to set. During the game, and the windows in, in Memorial is going to be open, and it's going to be freaking cold. Wait, Oregon's a home game. Oregon is a home game, December fifth at four p.m. Mm. Yep. So yeah, that's it. Do you have any thoughts on on Oregon, Andy? Before we close this out, I mean, I hope we can get the dub. Mm. I think their defense looks really vulnerable. Mm-hmm. This is the offense's game to uh, to win for us. Yeah. If we if Chris Brown is still not healthy to go, and we start Damian Moore, and our offensive line gets a plays a little bit above average and gets a push, I think uh, I think we we might. God, I hate. I am going to hate myself for saying this, but we could Stanford out this win. We we could. I think it's it's very possible seeing how Oregon State won last week. It's very possible to take that same approach and try and win it. There's no reason not to say that. I mean, we have a good shot in this game. Be interested to see what the lines are, given that we've disappointed Vegas three straight times. <laughs> so be that'll be fun. But yeah, positive thoughts, positive vibes. That's all I got. You know, really is is going into it. Just trying to remember, hey, low expectations can sometimes lead to great things. Mm-hmm. Well, it's duck hunting season, baby. Let's go get let's go get some ducks. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. This is the California Golden Bear Cast, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. If you're listening to this, then you already found us, so I don't need to tell you where you find us. But you can find our written stuff at rightforcalifornia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Golden Bear Cast, on Twitch at Golden Bear Cast on uh, YouTube at right for Calif- youtube.com backslash right for California. We're doing live watch along live streams for all the games. So you can hop on, chat with the writers, ask them questions. Uh, we analyze the game like as they happen. So it's, it's actually pretty fun. People have been, ha- people have been having a lot of fun with it. So definitely hop on for that. If you're listening to this on Monday, I think there's a men's basketball game later on Monday and we'll have a live watch along for that as well. So you can, Hop onto there and talk about Mark Fox and uh, the basketball team, which doesn't look as bad as we expected it to be. But that's a pot for another day. One and oh. One and one. Oh, what? Yeah, we lost <laughs> we lost to Oregon State. We lost to Oregon State to start the year. But we beat North but we beat NAIA school Northwest. <laughs> we dominated them. <laughs> yeah, we dominated them. But uh, here's the silver uh, I don't know if it's a silver over here we were undefeated and we've already lost. We beat Northwest by 25. Do you want to know how much Oregon State beat Northwest by? No. <laughs> they beat them by 70. So I don't know what this what that says about us versus them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Once again, this is the California Golden Bear Cast. Thanks for listening. And as always, go Bears. Go Bears.
We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Indeed. 